Nah, uh, oh, kind of. Just go to the Facebook tab and then just send them the right. Check the stream there. New Year, uh, the uh, New York Symposium with Diane Sayre. I'm Diane Sayre. I am a an independent LaRouche candidate running for U.S. Senate in 2024, the seat currently held by Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and it is January 6th. Uh, we are in oh, and I should also say, besides Happy New Year, Merry Christmas to those of you who are observing Christmas today and tomorrow, uh, as people may or may not be aware, the uh, patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church and President Putin have declared a ceasefire, a Christmas ceasefire, which began this morning at 4 a.m. in New York time, and it will end at 4 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. I understand the Russians are observing it, not surprisingly, the Ukrainians are not, and they said it was just a cynical ploy because I guess nobody um, can think of doing anything good or humanitarian in this world. And that's really the problem that we have to address. A couple of weeks ago, my husband and I reviewed with you George Washington's farewell address where he warns about a number of things, the issue of party, the question of foreign relations. Mm -hmm. He also talks about the question of culture and education because it is actually the case that in the United States, the American people in our form of a democratic republic, the American people do have an enormous amount of power. That is one of the reasons why what happened two years ago today, January 6th, has been played as it has been as an, an insurrection uh, where people are in solitary confinement to this day. And somehow it was used as a pretext to try and limit the accessibility of people to the Congress. Uh, I understand that's shifted a bit now, but at least for the last a couple of years, it was impossible to walk through the halls of Capitol Hill. Um, you could visit your congress congressman's local office, but if you wanted to get into any of the office buildings on Capitol Hill, you had to have an appointment. You would be escorted. Uh, this is not what our founding fathers intended. Uh, and we have a representative form of government because it doesn't mean that the majority is always right, but you have to have a balance between these groups. And what Washington warned about is given the amount of power that the American people have, it could be very devastating if the culture, the morality, the educational level, the literacy of the population becomes debased or degraded. And that is exactly what the British Empire, aided by the CIA, uh, started to do really in the 50s and 60s with a project known as the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And I think that has contributed greatly to how we can be in a situation today where we have a government which is completely, insanely marching us toward potential thermonuclear war, uh, spending $100 billion uh, to aid a very corrupt regime in Ukraine 
while we have uh, millions of Americans in poverty, in facing hyperinflation, and while you have potentially billions of people worldwide facing death by starvation, it's completely disproportional. And then I read today that a six-year-old apparently shot his teacher. That's the United States. So we have to change this. And I'm really happy to have um, my friend Susan Bowen on tonight to discuss an aspect of the American Revolution that isn't much thought about. Before I get to that, I just want to say one other thing about why this is so important, which is what happened with the Minsk Accords. People may be aware that first former Ukrainian President Poroshenko said that the Minsk process was really a fraud. No one intended for there to be peace. They just wanted to use it to buy time for the Ukrainian army to be prepared to go to war with Russia. Then Angela Merkel actually seemed to confirm that in comments she made saying, well, uh, Ukraine is now a different Ukraine. This process gave them time to arm. And then Francois Hollande, who was then president of France during this, uh, for which Helga Zeplerouche has called him the lying Dutchman, <laughs> um, as opposed to flying Dutchman. But at any rate, um, the same thing. So from the eyes of Russia, if you want to come to a non-military end to this conflict, conflict, with whom can you negotiate? It's obvious that Zelensky is not acting on his own accord, whether he's being controlled by the uh, Banderist Nazi elements in Ukraine or uh, British and American intelligence. It's not clear, but he's not his own person. So you have to have someone in the West who is trustworthy. Well, the Western leadership has pretty well demonstrated that it's not to be trusted. How do we restore that? And that's why there are a series of events coming up, uh, emphatically the event this Sunday, sponsored by my campaign at 2 o'clock, on uh, this question of how does the U.S. regain its trustworthiness. And then uh, on Martin Luther King weekend, the 14th of uh, January, next Saturday, Again, the question of the Kennedy assassination, the King assassination, but particularly papers, which were to have been released in 2017 on the Kennedy assassination that were withheld uh, in great part because of our former warmongering Secretary of State and former head of the CIA, Mike Pompeo, and now President Biden has refused to release them. And I would say that it would be very hard for the world to trust a nation that allows, in effect, a coup, an assassination of a president, doesn't get to the bottom of it and allows the conditions where the people who perpetrated that assassination end up, in effect, running the country. So that's what we have to change. But I think this question of uh, culture, the culture of the American Revolution and a certain cultural uh fight going on in Europe at the same time will give you some insight into that. So I think this will be a lot of fun, and I'm going to turn it over to Susan because I think she has a lot to say. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Susan, for being with us. Thank you, Diane. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I hit... Uh, um, I'm not sure. Can you see my slide no. or no? No. Oh. I click to share, share. And you have to pick what you're sharing. Uh, no, it's um some I'm sorry. We did it before. I can't believe this. Um, no, we're not. Um I may need assistance from our experts there because um that is not what I wanted to do. Um let's see. Whoa, what happened? Oh. Do you have the slide that you want to show up on your browser now? Yeah, I have the whole thing up on my browser and, okay. and Jose was able to see it before. We'll go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the green share screen icon. That's what I don't see. I, I saw Just it. move the cursor, move it down. Can you see yourself in Zoom? Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. 
wrong wrong page. Okay. All right. So much for my genius. Of, there we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. You see, Mr. Da Ponte, right? Yep. Okay. Um. After the series of the shocks that uh, Diane just mentioned, the assassinations of Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, RFK, and the international allies and the cover-ups in the 60s, the British Empire went to work on cultural engineering to change the paradigm of the U.S. from scientific progress, economic development, third world development, to zero growth, Malthusian, uh, anti-science, hedonistic crapola. So we were never perfect as a nation or a culture for sure, but, and there's been an ongoing battle for the minds of the population for centuries. And now given the uh, nuclear war danger and the technology to apply Venetian intelligence methods, we're in a final showdown. So I want you to meet some of our friends from the past, classical poets, musicians, artists, writers, and classical art is super important because it functions to educate the passions and the personal moral character in society on which a democratic republic depends. So here's my friend Lorenzo da Ponte. Um, who published his memoirs in three parts after he was in the United States. And what these do is elaborate in great detail his background and history from the Jewish ghetto in Venice, where he tussled directly with the oligarchy, um, to the imperial capital of Vienna, where he worked with Mozart, to New York City, where his circles included some of the most important American system thinkers. Take a look. <clears throat> Here you see some of the people who are connected to this guy, Lorenzo da Ponte. You see Benjamin Franklin, U.S. President Monroe. You see Mozart, Gauss, Samuel Morse. And the bottom is a number of American writers of a next generation. Um, Quite a, quite a collection. These are just a few of his writings, 28 operas, you know, for many, many uh, um, composers. And um, it doesn't include on this list the many, op the many uh, orations and articles, political, including political and scientific ones that he gave in the United States. So let's meet him a little bit. He's a very good guy. We should get to know him. This is uh, Lorenzo de Ponte as a young man. And um, he was, uh, and this is, of course, Benjamin Franklin. We know him. But what we may not know is that in the 1770s, Benjamin Franklin was the talk of the town. Uh, young Lorenzo uh, was forced to become a priest. And one of his jobs was teaching, which of course he loved. And he was teaching at the moment that everybody was putting lightning rods on the roofs. In Italy, they were talking of electricity and most importantly, the American Revolution. And uh, what we ended up having was a very uh, inspired teacher who um, took the American Revolution to heart. And as a result, he got in trouble for it. He did teach Dante. He did teach the Italian language, poetry, and all of that. But he got in trouble. Now, I recommend you go to EIR and the Schiller Institute because um, the, the methods of Venice, or these days, I guess they say six ways to Sunday, uh, the methods of the Venetian oligarchy have brought down governments and done some pretty nasty things for a while. And uh, this here, you can see the mouth of the lion in which accusations could be placed. 
against somebody you wanted to set up. In 17, that was the environment of the of Venice. In 1776, uh, the year of the American Revolution, the Ponte was honored with uh, giving a scientific presentation, and he chose the subject of happiness. So he it was designed to show the skill of the poet using languages, meter, all of the poetic principles. And he penned a debate. And the debate was called The American in Europe. And it had a prose dialogue, a prologue rather, four Latin poems, 11 Italian poems, each with its own concept in the form of a Socratic dialogue. And it was recited by the best students and composed pro and con so that the students would be able to present that. However, the Venetian Inquisition took the opportunity to go ballistic and they banned the work when it was published. They banned the teacher, Lorenzo da Ponte. And when uh, a famous author, Gozzi, went to the Inquisition and said, yeah, really, you should be lenient. He's so talented. These inquisitioners said, ah, yes, so much the worst. Excuse me, so much the worst. We must deprive him of the means of becoming dangerous. So his uh, his friends and protectors um, in uh, in Venice helped to set him up as well. And he had to, to flee within a couple of years. Just so you get a picture of Venice, um, I mean, Lorenzo had other problems, but you really have to understand why the Venetian oligarchy is important to understand if you're going to be in politics in any country today. Um, these are this is at the Ridotto, and you can see that all of these nice, respectable people and mayors and priests and whatever are hiding behind their masks. It was the epitome of hypocrisy. And the idea was it wasn't just during carnival, but throughout all the time, they would hide behind their masks and stay out all night and, you know, be involved in the worst kind of debauchery and degenerate behavior. And it was all accepted because in the morning they took off the mask and they could go back to work. And there they were, just like they were the day before. It was all normal. Now you look at these slides, and even though it looks like it's just a party, it's important to know that the political system of the Serene Republic was just like their social system. And in fact, it was the difference between appearance and the reality of it. James Fenimore Cooper understood that this was not a republic, it was a police state. And he wrote the Bravo about it, and Schiller wrote the Ghost Seer about it. So it was very clear Da Ponte had some problems there, but um, this is the environment in which he was stuck, so to speak. He left Venice a couple of years after, and he went to, he traveled in various ways. And you're going to have to read the memoirs or my article <laughs> to get a lot of the documentation. But he met a lot of interesting people. He, in fact, did a lot of what is today called networking and um, including um, political uh, leaders and others who had been involved in not only literary, but also political circles like um, the Cobensal family and others. So um, <clears throat> he left that small town after a couple of years and along the way, uh, met more interesting people, but he ended in Vienna where he wanted to go, the grand capital of the empire. And here you had um, a very interesting situation. He arrived in 1781 and he worked with the various poets and musicians and artists, including the famous Metastasio, whose praise of De Ponte was critical in getting him an, an appointment and then a post as the imperial poet for the new Italian theater that Emperor Joseph, who you see on the slide here, had just created. Da Ponte met with the emperor and the emperor himself was intimately involved with music and arts in his area. 
Um, I'm just going to show some slides for time reasons to give you a flavor of some of what was happening in Vienna. He worked, uh, Da Ponte worked with Salieri. And um, most importantly, um, Da Ponte met Mozart. And this was a pretty remarkable situation um, because, um, well, uh, I'll just go through some of this. They met in 1783 in one of the cultural salons uh, there, which was frequented by musicians, political operatives, lots of other intellectuals, and they were hotbeds of pro-American sentiment uh, and activity, as well as scientific breakthroughs, musical, every kind of discussion you can imagine. And it was there that Mozart and Ponte discussed a libretto. Um, Mozart didn't think it was going to happen. And um, Da Ponte was busy as the imperial poet, but as soon as he finished, he was ready. And they got together. And um, this is one of the more important things that Da Ponte says in his memoirs. Um, he makes the point that uh, he really had something to do with bringing Mozart's genius to the fore. He says, though gifted with superior talents to those of any other composer in the world, past, present, or future, Mozart had, thanks to the intrigues of his rivals, never been able to exercise his divine genius in Vienna and was living there unknown and obscure like a priceless jewel buried in the bowels of the earth. And so he goes on to make the point that he had to figure out how he was going to oppose all of the people who tended to be against, that is not his musical rivals, his political rivals and others. And he figured it out. Uh, he actually did because he was the imperial poet and he waited until he made sure there was no other opera. <laughs> and he said, oh, uh, Emperor Joseph, you have to, uh, you know, you have to, it's time to, you try this. Um, this is Mozart in a partially finished uh, picture that was painted by uh, the sister-in-law of a friend of Schiller. This is Mozart's wife, and they were in Vienna in 1783. And it was the discussion of Mozart and Da Ponte to create a revolutionary opera, revolutionary in music, which we have written about, and revolutionary politically um, to uh, ensure that it was possible to break the brainwashing of the peasantry and oppose uh, the nobles who did not want any kind of reform, whether it was Joseph or anybody of an American revolutionary type. So, here we go. The most important operas, I think, in history are the Marriage of Figaro in, in Italian, Le Nozze di Figaro, Don Giovanni, Cosi Fan Tutte. All three of these developed sublime music, metaphor, and poetry to take on not only the corruption of the evil oligarchy, but also the stupidity of the population in general. And I know that we uh, don't have a lot of time. I'm going to show you a couple of things here uh, so, so that you um, get a picture of this. And then uh, hopefully we have time. We can show a clip, just one clip. Well, maybe we'll stick it in anyway um, so that you get a sense, because I know a lot of people are not even familiar with opera at all. Here's the... Oh, just a few slides to give you a, a flavor of this. Um, and it's important, you know, to know that um, Figaro, the marriage of Figaro was an entire revolution. And it reflected the ideas of 1776 that all men are create all mankind, all men and women are created equal. And this was the challenge to the nobility as well as the population. How do you change the axioms of government, right? So they used, 
you know, new musical settings, um, disguises, humor, jokes. They talked about fidelity, love. Are you noble because you have the right blood or are you noble because you have uh, uplifted yourself to a higher level? And what does that mean? What is perception? And what's the truth behind that perception? So this is what they did. It's not soap opera. The storyline is very complex, um, but I will give you a little flavor of it and we'll show that very short clip uh, in a minute. Um, the oligarch whose account intends to use his not right of the first night, that is that the, the uh, he's allowed to sleep with the bride before the wedding, before the groom does. And even though the practice had been officially banned and it was a typical thing that was going on, all of these practices that uh, had been banned were something that the nobles wanted to continue to do. So the target was the uh, was Figaro's wife, the, the servant of the countess. Anyway, they plan and trick and there are a number of uh, operations. The first plan goes awry. They put together another plan and the uh, and there's you have to see this opera. I hope everybody gets a chance to watch it. But what I decided to do is to give you, since a lot of people have never heard opera or think it's for something else, I did, please take a look at the slide because um, it, right early on in this opera, two of the nobles discuss how they're going to teach this upstart rascal Figaro, this servant, they're going to teach him a lesson. After all, he had screwed them up before because Bartolo had a plan to marry Rosina. So what he says he's going to do is he's going to do everything in the book, every legal dirty operation that you can imagine to set him up. It actually may remind you of how Mr. LaRouche was set up. And here's the uh, the video clip. And this is the uh, um, then. Well, you'll see the subtitles under the clip. Um, but and it's pretty short. So, uh, Diane, can you put that up? Yep. Uh, you have to stop sharing for a minute. OK. And then. OK, here we go. Oh, 
Are we back here? Okay. I just want to make sure I don't keep playing that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, just a back. clip. <laughs> um, that's, I, I was really trying to, there were a million clips I would have liked everybody to see, but I encourage you to see this um, opera uh, when you can. Um, we have, <clears throat> this th this was a success. It was unbelievable the way they got it, but it was a success. And I know we have to get to America. So <clears throat> uh, after its success, they worked on Don Giovanni, which we're going to have to come back to another time. Uh, because although a lot of people hear about Don Giovanni, Don Juan, the Don Juan story was from the 1600s. You've heard it, and they made it into plays and puppet shows and everything else. But generally, they were morality plays, right? The good guy, the bad guy gets it in the end, and we all live happily ever after. But that's not what this is. What what uh, these guys, uh, Da Ponte and Mozart, did was completely transform it to become a weapon of war in the arsenal of cultural um <clears throat> you know, uh, cultural uh, battles, for cultural battles. And that's, of course, always the essence of art. Bach did it, Shakespeare, Schiller, Shelley. They took stories that were well-known, that, um, that were folk tales, that were folk songs, and they transformed them into something else. And Don Giovanni was not just a sex maniac, you know, lecher. He was the epitome of the old paradigm, the master slave, or in the case of Europe, the master peasant relations. And what these guys did was they put a mirror in front of the population and in front of the nobles, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, so that they could see, <clears throat> excuse me, not only the mindset, but how to get a way out. And the uh, one of the things here's you can see that from the premiere, um, but there's one thing, since we don't have a lot of time, that I think is critical to show you. And that is <clears throat> that um, what Goethe wrote to Schiller in the year 1797. He said, the hopes you had for opera might have been fulfilled to a high degree recently in Don Giovanni. However, this work stands entirely on its own, and Mozart's death has uh, destroyed any prospect of it being repeated. So <clears throat> we can come back to that if there's time. This is one of the most important things, and we will come back to it. <clears throat> but uh, we're going to move on to uh, uh, the last, the daughter, the third daughter of. Um, uh, uh, the geniuses, um, and you have to read our articles to get more details on that. It was put together in 1790, so you had 1786, 87, and then 1790, and of course, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, Don Giovanni uh, was premiering when there was a U.S. Constitutional Convention and a number of other things. Cossi was premiering um, uh, with the collapse of the economy in Austria, the French Revolution, a kind of a mess with uh, uh, Emperor Joseph finally dying, the reforms being collapsed, and <clears throat> was kind of uh, very poor. Mozart died in 1791, and Leopold left, excuse me, 
uh, uh, Lorenzo left um, the uh, um, the capital, and on his way, he met and married his wife, uh, Nancy, or her name was Anna Celestine Grau, and they went on their way, intending to go to Paris, and ended up having to change course in order to go to London because of the French Revolution and the disasters. This is uh, Da Ponte's wife. And uh, in London, they were there for many years. And hopefully, uh, we'll get a number of people to work with us to uh, fill that uh, part of the story in. We know that he met with many, many visitors. We know he worked with intellectuals. And I think he met with Joseph Haydn, though I don't know. We'll have to find that out. In 1805, <clears throat> excuse me, the author of the American Elegies, the American in Europe, arrives in New York, well, Philadelphia, then New York, and through his father-in-law, because the family was already, already there, he becomes a grocer and a bookseller, a grocery store uh, person. And he has a lot of jokes about that in his memoirs. He um, he uh, continued to uh, work on selling books, translating, putting together the beginnings of of a library, <clears throat> and in particular, really bringing um, Dante to as many people as he could. He met in the bookstore um, in New York the scholar and the teacher Clement Moore. Clement. Uh, Seymour. And he became Da Ponte's student and lifelong friend. Uh, you can read some of the uh, material on the on uh, the slide. He also helped uh, Da Ponte set up the Manhattan Academy for Young Gentlemen and Nancy's Manhattan Academy for Young Ladies, where they taught languages and some of the other um, sciences and other kinds of things. So here you can see he was a professor, um, the son of Benjamin Moore. It was at Benjamin Moore's house where he began his uh, teaching, actually. Um, and he, um, they, there was a very bad yellow fever epidemic going on. Uh, so um, they... Uh, they um, moved after a while. And uh, in 1811, he, uh, I lost some of my slides here. He was in Sunbury from 1811 to 1818. Um, Lorenzo says very little about this period, but he traveled back and forth to Philadelphia for the grocer and his book selling business about 72 times. And the few people that he does mention, because he say he he um uh he doesn't discuss it much, but he mentions them. They were uh, members of the American Philosophical Society, which had been founded by Benjamin Franklin and was a one another hotbed of political, intellectual, scientific American system um, activity. So let's go through them briefly. Um, I, I don't know if I showed this. Um, so uh, when he was, okay, I did that. Um, here we are. Um, Dr. Philip Singh Physic is known as the father of American surgery. He is one of Da Ponte's associates and a member of the uh, uh, um, you know, American Philosophical Society. Char uh, Charles Ingersoll, who was a congressman, an, a U.S. attorney, and a sit and a real American system economic system fighter. In fact, he was the person who helped bring Friedrich List to the United States. Um, in uh, in, and and Ponte's son worked in his office for a while. Um. 
there is nothing about Matthew Carey, but given the fact that the two guys traveled in exactly the same circles, maybe someone can help and do some research and find a connection between them. The uh, uh, So that's that's important. All right, so um, Del Ponte came back to New York in 1818. He was happy, really happy to return. <laughs> he resumed his uh, friendship with uh, uh, Clement Moore, and he moved among a number of notables, including um, his cousin Nathaniel Moore, Julian for Plank, um, Fritz Halleck, Fritz Halleck um, William Cullen Bryant, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Samuel Ward, who was later the author of a biography or memoir on Duponte, Julia, Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and James Fenimore Cooper, and also Washington Irving, who mentions Signor da Ponte in one of his uh, writings. Samuel Morse, John Francis, William McNevin. Uh, this is an amazing list. Many of them were members of the Bread and Cheese Club of New York, which lasted a couple of years, 1824 to 1827, and continued informally after that. Uh, this included uh, the painters, <clears throat> Thomas Cole, William Dunblap, Asher Duran, Henry Inman, John Wesley Jarvis, and of course, if you hear these names and you see these neighborhoods and streets, you may now know who they're named after in Manhattan, <clears throat> Queens, Long Island, and elsewhere. Painter and inventor Samuel Morse, uh, writers William Cullen Bryant, Fitz Green Halleck, Jay Hillhouse, Washington Irving, James Paulding, Percival, uh, Robert Charles Sands, and as I said, Julian for Plank, Charles King, uh, James Elworth Decay, John Wake, Dr. Francis, uh, James Kent, and merchant Philip Hone. Uh, this was a group that was visited by, um, uh, by uh, the Marquis de Lafayette when he came to uh, New York in 1824. <clears throat> this beautiful picture, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is the front piece of Byron's Prophecy of Dante, which was published in 1822. Uh, Del Ponte's son had just died and he was really um, jumping into, as they mourned, they were really uh, thinking, trying to be very profound. Uh, it's engraved, as you can see, by um, uh, Michele Pecanino, uh, who was part of the Asher Durand, i.e. the Bread and Cheese Club networks. And Nathaniel Rogers, of course, was trained uh, by those guys, uh, and uh, Samuel Morris in particular. And these are, these, I hope, I know I'm only giving a general broad brush uh, stroke, but it's kind of important to take a notice because this is each one of these guys does represent an entire um, research project, which will be really fun for New York. Uh, <clears throat> James Fenmore Cooper, I think I always said that, um, already said that, um, was involved directly in the bread and cheese. Club. He was the founder of it. And I think I also mentioned that he wrote the Bravo after um, as a direct attack on the Venetian method and the Venetian oligarchy. He was a diplomat and also he had front row seats at the New York performance of uh, Don Giovanni. And we're gonna get into that in a minute. Here's another friend of Mr. Da Ponte is uh, Congressman Julian Ferplank, who uh, was not only a congressman, but chairman of the Ways and Means Committee until he had a fight with President Jackson on the issue of Hamilton's National Bank. He was one of the first boarding students 
I didn't say too much, but between 1808 and 1811, um, they were there was a boarding school besides the uh, academy, the Manhattan Academies for young men and ladies, young gentlemen and young ladies. People were boarders there, and they stayed and ate and in, engaged in music ovens and poetry readings, and they learned about pasta and all kinds of other Italian cuisine, and uh, engaged in really dramatic discussions. Uh, Julian Verplanck was not only a, a, an Italian student of Da Ponte, but he was a Shakespeare scholar, as well as a uh, the person who uh, got a bulk purchase of Italian language and other books for the Library of Congress from Da Ponte a little later um, than this. Uh, Dr. John Wakefield Francis. Um, I hope Diane finds and reads his reminiscences of old New York, which are a really remarkable history. And I actually uh, recommend it if you can find it. I wasn't able to find it, but I think you will. Dr. Francis was uh, not only uh, another freedom fighter, um, he was one of the key people in founding many of the medical societies and colleges and um, uh, um, and, and wrote a lot about that uh, in New York and elsewhere. He was a dear friend of Lorenzo. As you can see, he uh, recited for him, Lorenzo recited for him uh, as in, on his deathbed last couple of days before he died. And of course, he's also, as I mentioned twice already in the Bread and Cheese Club. And uh, he was the doctor for both uh, Da Ponte and Edgar Allan Poe and Virginia Poe, who died earlier. Uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, we've also covered and even did a symposium on, was a uh, not only a poet and a writer, but was a U.S. intelligence agent uh, who also had those connections in a different city uh, with Lafayette. William McNevin, another doctor, uh, an Irish patriot, was arrested in the 1790s um, for his, uh, his activities in fighting the British Empire in Ireland and um, was uh, very interesting that he had um, uh, been in Vienna in 1784. Did they meet at that time? I don't know, but uh, he came to the U.S. and he uh, was not only involved in founding a number of these uh, medical institutions, but he uh, has, was involved in really fighting all the time against the prejudices and the uh, attacks on um, Irish Americans in New York, as was Da Ponte, very, very active in fighting against defamation against Italians and Italy in New York. It was a pretty wild period. And it was getting, it was actually getting kind of a lot worse um, in the, as we moved from the 20s to the 30s. This lovely painting that was in the beginning was painted by Samuel Morse. In the memoirs and elsewhere, to give you a sense of this, there was no mention of Samuel Morse. There was no mention of a lot of these people. <clears throat> so it's, uh, um, it, it was funny because you would have to, you would be surprised what you might find if you keep, uh, when you, you know, start looking around for these networks. It's almost like in 20 years, when you look back at the websites and the conferences and the symposium and like the Schiller conferences, and you see all of the different people from Carlo Bergonzi and William Warfield to the ambassador you know, to Russia, whatever, from Russia, and you see networks and you'd have to begin to figure it out uh, for what what actually was going on. Um, Henry James Anderson, Bread and Cheese Club, was uh, his son-in-law. 
And he was not only, he was also a boarder at the school early on. He lived into the 1870s. He uh, worked with uh, many people and he um, was instrumental not only in developing breakthroughs in mathematics, but also worked very closely with Benjamin Franklin's grandson, Beige, and uh, um, Francois Arago and Gauss on the um, Magnetische Verein, the Magnetic Association, because he they went to Europe as well. President James Monroe, uh, was the uh, uncle of Lorenzo de Ponte's um, uh, daughter-in-law, uh, Cornelia, so um, who married Lorenzo Jr., or Lorenzo L., they call him. Lorenzo L. de Ponte, his son, was a teacher like his father, and he had decided that he, when he did his history of the Medici, I, Medici, I believe it's 30 volu 33 volumes or so, he said he's going, he wants to do it from an American perspective, not a British perspective. So this was published a little bit later, and I don't have a picture of him or Cornelia, but of course, you know that uh, um, John Quincy Adams was the, uh, <clears throat> the, um, a very important figure in American history and was uh, not only president, but was in the uh, Monroe administration as well. <clears throat> I'm going to try to wrap up uh, soon. <laughs> um, it wouldn't be complete unless you had a sense of, you know, the, the work that De Ponte did with music, right? He brought uh, Rossini's uh, Barbara of Seville to New York in 1826, he had to organize an entire opera troupe, singers, orchestra, the whole bit, uh, to perform Don Giovanni, uh, which was um, a, a com really, really a big success. He um, put together the, uh, he wrote early on a hymn to America, which I'm still trying to find, but Starting in 1832, each of the concerts that was put on by the composer and concertmaster Antonio Bajoli uh, started, but that is opened and closed with Da Ponte's Hymn to America. Uh, in 1828, Da Ponte became a, um, an American citizen and he put together the first opera house, the New York Opera Company. These are some of the musicians with whom he worked. Manuel Garcia, very famous. Uh, his son, M Manuel Garcia sang Don Giovanni. Um, Manuel Jr. sang Leporello. Uh, Maria Malibran was in it. And, um, and he uh, put together the uh, opera house, um, although it ended up not lasting very long. And uh, we can sh go back to some of the um, Giovanni material in a little bit, if possible. Um, I did also want to just mention that uh, from Columbia University, where this portrait of Da Ponte hangs today in the Italian Academy or Italian department, um, you know, the uh, in the library, you know, there's a little report that says that anyone consulting mid 19th century catalogs of New York's two oldest libraries would be struck by the astonishing number of Italian books recorded. There are as many works of Italian fiction listed in the topically arranged 1839 Columbia catalog, Columbia Ca College catalog as there are works in all other literatures combined, including English. And um, in the manuscript uh, catalog, Ro Ro Romaic, Latin, Spanish, French, and English fiction constitutes a single group, while the Italian entries are so numerous that the language merits its own, uh, its own category. So this was one of the things that Da Ponte did he did teach 2500 students in new york and um uh 
certainly left a heck of a legacy. <clears throat> so uh, from his, uh, he died, as happened, um, um, in 1838. And, and, uh, um, and they had an enormous funeral in St. Patrick's Cathedral. It, it had a, a huge crowd uh, of both the most cultured, literate names, and also the richest and also the poorest. Many of uh, many Italian Americans and other people who loved freedom and had fought for freedom, and some of whom had been jailed in Europe, participated. There wasn't a marker uh, uh, at the uh, at the cemetery, and it was moved. And here is where you can see that today in Queens. <clears throat> um, and what I wanted to just do is, is read a little bit of one of the obituaries that was in the paper um, at that time. They say, uh, Lorenzo da Ponte died on 17 August, 1838 in New York. And then, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, but, um, yeah. here we go. Here's the obituary. <laughs> The closing 30 years of an existence so rife with incident and adventure terminated in this city at nine o'clock on Friday evening, the 17th day of August, 1838. Two days previous to this event, his sick chamber presented an interesting spectacle. Dr. J.W. Francis, his friend and kind physician since the old operatic days, to whom the aged poet had in gratitude addressed a parting ode on the day preceding, perceiving symptoms of approaching dissolution, notified his numerous friends of the change in the venerable patient. It was one of those afternoons of waning summer when the mellow sunset foretells approaching autumn. The old poet's magnificent head lay upon a sea of pillows and the conscious eye still shed its beams of regard all around him. Besides several of his countrymen were assembled some remnants of the old Italian troop, uh, the opera troupe, who knelt for a farewell blessing around the palate of their expiring bard. Among them might be seen the fine head of Fora Nassari and Signor Bajoli's benevolent count countenance. All wept as the patriarch bade them an affectionate and earnest farewell and implored a blessing on their common countries. The doctor, watching the flickerings of the life torch, stood at the head of the couch and a group of fearful women at the foot completed a, a scene not unlike the portraiture we have all seen at the last hours of Napoleon. I have not seen that portrait, but um, I guess there's a lot more that I will go through again, but they're not academic issues. Whenever you hear somebody compare Da Ponte to Don Giovanni, it's a bold faced lie. It's just not true. Um, these are not academic issues. And what, what Da Ponte did with his literature and with opera and in America was not just entertainment. And he understood what Diane started with, the absolute urgency of culture and uh, being able to, um, to arm the population with these ideas as a weapon against this evil. And a quarter century ago in 97, in Fidelio magazine, Mr. LaRouche wrote the following. He said, today's trends in popular culture parallel syphilis, tuberculosis, or AIDS. It wasn't spread as an epidemic of sudden death like the bubonic plague. It has developed as a lingering degenerative disease which represents specific damage to that specific mental function, which distinguishes the human species from the beasts. Today, that was the quote, today the financial oligarchy is weak, but we know they use media, culture, entertainment 
to manipulate people to be or into acting anyway, like subjects of an empire instead of citizens. So since the battlefield of all politics is the mind, if we learn from these thinkers and artists and writers and et cetera, we can outflank this entire bunch of feudalist fascist oligarchs and their leporellos. So I know there's no time for, well, thank you. <laughs> we can go back to Don Giovanni in Vienna and Venice. <laughs> If you can uh, stop sharing, then we can both be up there, I think, if one of our nice hosts will do that. There we go. Um, that was fun. And I actually, it's really striking how intertwined all these networks are. And what you said when you reviewed the book where your article is, because you made the point that you what they left out was the question of politics. So, or, and what I would say is people... <clears throat> you could put it the other way, which is that people think that things like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were political, but not cultural, mm -hmm. right? So right, people exactly. say, well, um, the United States hasn't made any great cultural contributions. Well, wait, <laughs> so maybe you want to say something more about that question. Um, well, there are, I mean, of course we did. In fact, um, the uh well it's always been a battle it's always been a real fight and there were shakespeare um uh well let me put it this way in the 1830s most people know about the battles in europe revolutionary battles in the united states what began to happen was that the british went really on a tear and they began to not only um push for Jim Crow was the big popular operation. They, they, uh, which was a white guy who used blackface. Um, and um, what we know as the racist laws that were really big in the 1890s and, and beyond uh, was effectively the entertainment. They used the entertainment to stop the basic Shakespeare theaters and everything else that was of the quality that um, they wanted. There were theaters. I mean, you know, Schubert was reading um, James Fenimore Cooper on it on his deathbed, right? And there were leader abend and there were leader evenings and there were other kinds of things. And so it was always, when you look at the networks, I'm not sure if this is, you know, what you're looking at, but these were political networks that were enga engaged in the same way that Einstein was a violinist and Max Planck was a pianist. I mean, they weren't different. Um, in the 50s in the United States, um, when Sputnik went up in 57, uh, the Congress and other NASA, I guess, and the other forces said, uh-oh, we better not only we better create astronauts, but how were they going to do it at that time? The purpose was to defeat at that time the Soviet Union or not defeat, but get ahead of the Soviet Union. However, that what they had to do was they had to in that they had to have in public schools, they had to have um, uh, music in every class, creative writing in every class, art. And, you know, they actually had to train people as if we were gonna have a renaissance because that was what was necessary for the, um, to, to have the space program. Of course, that stopped very shortly, especially with the death of Kennedy, um, it stopped. But um, these, there was American, uh, there were, I mean, America was a center of this kind of thing. And I, I do have other slides. It was also in Philadelphia um, where there were, you know, these these operas and these other presentations were made. So, uh, um, you know, I'm just thinking about what the priest said at the uh, funeral mass for Kennedy when they did the Requiem Mass in 1964. 
And he made the point that the Kennedys had brought all of these classical artists into the White House. Right. If you think about uh, Marian Anderson. Exactly. You, know, uh, uh, you think about and the kind of horrible music that people listen to today or perform to. I'll never forget. I was so um, freaked out the first time I actually intervened on uh, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. This must have been in 2011. And he was holding a town hall meeting. <clears throat> and the room was set up with the place where he was going to speak was like a, a boxing ring. <laughs> it was <laughs> a roped off square. <clears throat> and you had a crowd on all four sides. And then what they did was they started playing, and I don't know the names of any rock, I mean, not any, but I, I'm i not very good at associating rock songs with who produced them. But anyway, some awful boom, 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 rock music. And then he, who at the time weighed close to 7,000 pounds, possibly comes, you know, waddling into this noise in the middle of, and this is considered some kind of entrance. I mean, it's really sick. It's really awful. Uh, so in that case, they're using this, degenerate noise to go along with an e equally degenerate political message versus um, the idea of the kind of music, uh, the kind of music that you might have in an inauguration, for example, um, where you're seeking to really ennoble people and uplift them. And it's not seen as something separate from one's identity. Exactly. No, that's, that's really important. Um, and it, it, it's a lot worse now if you, uh, it's a lot worse now, but it culture or music, um, what is, um, is not, I mean, the way that most people think about it is how do they want to be entertained, right? How would you like to be entertained? You want to feel good. You know, this makes me right. really move, but the reality is that music is heard in the mind right it is a process of uplift um in different ways sometimes music without words is a little more difficult for people to grab that but it's not it's on a completely different level in the same way that uh scientific work is on a completely different level and that was that is and was the fight and it remains the fight and um um and unfortunately when you study these kinds of things including music or art you know they're instead of the approach that we have been taking not only in developing the networks but seeing how this functions um it, it either becomes academic um and interesting not that it's not interesting but it's what's the purpose here? Look at what we're facing. You have little kids. If you go to YouTube, you see little kids doing erotic dances at age six or five or three. You know, you're trying to look for something on uh, one of these American scholars and on the side come this, you know, you know, entertainment of something. And you say, my gosh, why? Why is this happening? And it's deliberate. It's warfare. And therefore, we are promoting, of course, Mozart's Requiem, and you know you see the importance of the uh, the polyphony, not just the notes, but the polyphony in something as basic as Dona Nobis Pacem in this kind of political period, because it's first of all people don't know it, um, and as I said, we we should or or hopefully we'll have something more on these operas in detail. Because the thing about an opera, which is so amazing, is it's not just drama and music, right? It's really an incredible uh, requirement of what I mentioned in a word, unity of effect. And just to give you an example, the Don Giovanni, although we didn't see it, there was a Don Giovanni opera performed in... Um, uh, in uh, Vienna, just a couple years before the one that Mozart and Ponte did, 
And you would think, well, nobody's, it's going to be the same, but it was completely and totally different. And in the US, there's one of these stories and, and this memoirs, this book memoirs of De Ponte is full of these riotous stories. And if you never knew metaphor, you'll begin to know it. But among the stories is a guy who's watching this Rossini opera uh, in New York, sitting next to Da Ponte, and he didn't know who the who Da Ponte was. And he said, "Hey, look, could you wake me up at this aria? I really want to hear it, and I, you know, I'd like to, uh, you know, be awake for it." So he says, "Sure." So he wakes him up, and that's that. And then the the next when he went to the Don Giovanni opera, he still didn't know who Da Ponte was, but Da Ponte sat next to him, and he says, "Do you want me to wake you up?" Uh, this is a paraphrase. Do you want me to wake you up? And the uh, the the uh, patron said, "Are you kidding? <laughs> uh, I'm not going. I can't sleep through this opera at all, and I can't sleep at night after it either." <laughs> so, so you know, you have this. Um, uh, it, it, it's it is urgent to teach children now right? Not just to sing, but to participate in that which is going to elevate and inspire them to inspire other people. Um, right. Because well, politics is art, art is politics. Schiller talks about this. I, I actually will read you something if I can find it, which was really, I thought, very important. Actually, um, uh, I can never find them. But um, where... You know, um, he talks about when everything is so barbaric in society, um, the only people who can pull it out are the artists and the scientists, because um, uh, I wish I had that quote. It's a really great quote. But I mean, what he basically says is that um, that. Uh, the despot doesn't have power over the ma of of the mind, you know, in in this kind of art, and therefore you have to have this uh, different kind of approach, um, which is what we uh, which is what we're fighting for. I mean, that I mean, it's so, such a wonderful thing to be human. I mean, the world is really screwed up, and the opportunity to correct it in a certain way, at least the way Da Ponte looked at it whether he was in Europe or in the United States, is an honor. That's what we're doing, right? He was a fundraiser. I was happy to see that. You know? <laughs> and, and unfortunately, when you read, if you do get to read some of these things, you'll read all of these things. Oh, yeah, this screwed up because he had bad business acumen or because he didn't know how to... Uh, uh, it's just the wildest things. I actually should show you this. I didn't get this. Oh, I don't know if you can see it. Keep this it near thing, your face. Put it in my face? No, where it stopped moving. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and no, hold it like in front of you. There, stop. It's okay. Anti Da Ponte. <laughs> what is I, it? I got it. I only got it recently because it was it was not in English. And it was when he left. It, it reminded me, really, uh, I mean, he's not Lynn, but it reminded me a lot of the kinds of things that people would do. They take a sentence, and uh, like a, a phrase, and then mistranslate it and then say, ah, this is a terrible attack. Um, right. Well, one of the things that I think is really important about opera, and we saw it in that little aria, the Vendetta, uh, is because especially when people have been so culturally destroyed, the music helps to inform your emotions. So you can see that he's making fun of people <laughs> who cling to the right, and the music is very fun. <laughs> and he has all these right, and and you be you get an it helps you to get self consciousness because you can look over your own shoulder and say, well, that is kind of silly. Do I really want to look like this goofy old? man um and and of course lynn once had a discussion with lyndon larouche once about reading shakespeare with some younger people and the difficulty they were having 
in reading not in a monotone oh, yeah, right. uh, and con- and conveying some sense of emotion and you know what you're reading you're not just the robot and he said watch an opera of the Shakespeare play like Verdi's Macbeth or something because the opera will help to educate the emotions and then when you go back to just looking at the Shakespeare you will be coming at it from an informed standpoint and I think we desperately need that now they've done everything to destroy people's ability to have a human emotion the way they cover things we're just we're, we are assaulted. We're emotionally assaulted over and over and over again in the media so that we're to become numb to the most hideous things or like Augustine described, getting addicted to bloodlust. Mm-hmm. I think the New York Post is one of the worst. I make a point of never clicking on any of their videos. Woman throws baby out the window. Watch the video here. Oh, Why would you want to? You know, right. it's really hideous and it's it's done to destroy you. Exactly. So when you think of hundreds of thousands of people in trenches in ice getting pneumonia, which is what the Ukrainian soldiers are doing for the um, Anglo-Dutch imperial order, you, you're not affected by it. Or six million children starving in Afghanistan. What's the matter, Susan? I I lost the picture somehow. I don't know. Oh, that's all right. Well, don't worry. I think we oh, have to wrap up. Okay. Sorry. So, I, that's okay. I don't see you, but I do hear you. So that's fine. Oh, it's fine. Well, we can see you very well. So don't do anything you don't want us to see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you want to say in parting? Well, I would hope that. Um, especially the people in the campaign and who are working in New York, pick up on some of this material, um, not just watching the operas, but actually looking at some of these amazing um, writers and thinkers, not just to uh, master their ideas, but to ensure <clears throat> in the way that De Ponte was working with the younger generation of Washington Irving and James Fenimore Cooper and others, that in fact, they that this torch is carried on um, by some of the people in your campaign or people who are watching tonight, because there's a lot to do. And it, it's totally exciting to discover all of this material. Yes, I agree. Well, thanks very much. And of course, we have to stay alive to discover it. Oh, you so. bet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'd like to just encourage everyone, please RSVP to come to the Zoom meeting on January 8th. That conference will not be live streamed on Facebook or YouTube because I want to be free to discuss various matters. And if you've been following the Twitter files, you know how much censorship we're under. Uh, So thanks, Susan. And we'll do this again. And hopefully you can come up to New York in person. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, good night. Good night.